Black Clock Audio Tales, edited by Daniel Spitzer. Black Clock Audio Tales is a PGTTCM production. Join us in our exploration of old ghost stories, supernatural fiction, horror tales, folk tales, fantasy, the gothic tradition, weird tales, and cosmic horror. Look for the podcast behind the loose brick on the north end of the Black Clock Tower, or wherever you find your podcasts. We suggest Podbean or Apple Podcasts. Help keep Black Clock Audio Tales running smoothly by donating five to ten bucks to paypal.me slash pgttcm. The title track is The Chamber by Kevin McLeod. Find us on the web at pgttcm.com and at Black Clock Audio on Instagram, Twitter, and the Facebook. And Black Clock Audio Tales on YouTube. Welcome to Black Clock Audio Tales. Lot 249 by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. In this strange way began the acquaintance between Edward Bellingham and Abercrombie Smith, an acquaintance which the latter at least had no desire to push further. Bellingham, however, appeared to have taken a fancy to his rough-spoken neighbour and made his advances in such a way that he could hardly be repulsed without absolute brutality. Twice he called to thank Smith for his assistance and many times afterwards he looked in with books, papers, and such other civilities as two bachelor neighbours can offer each other. He was, as Smith soon found out, a man of wide reading, with Catholic tastes, and an extraordinary memory. His manner, too, was so pleasing and suave that one came, after a time, to overlook his repellent appearance. For a jaded and wearied man he was no unpleasant companion, and Smith found himself, after a time, looking forward to his visits, and even returning them. Clever as he undoubtedly was, however, the medical student seemed to detect a flash of insanity in the man. He broke out at times into a high, inflated style of talk, which was in contrast with the simplicity of his life. "'It's a wonderful thing,' he cried, "'to feel that one can command powers of good and of evil.' a ministering angel or a demon of vengeance. And again of Monkhouse Lee, he said, Lee is a good fellow, an honest fellow, but he is without strength or ambition. He would not make a fit partner for a man with a great enterprise. He would not make a fit partner for me. At such hints and innuendos, stolid Smith, puffing solemnly at his pipe, would simply raise his eyebrows and shake his head, with little interjections of medical wisdom as to earlier hours and fresher air. One habit Bellingham had developed of late, which Smith knew to be a frequent herald of a weakening mind, he appeared to be forever talking to himself. At late hours of the night, when there could be no visitor with him, Smith could still hear his voice beneath him in a low, muffled monologue, sunk almost to a whisper, and yet very audible in the silence. This solitary babbling annoyed and distracted the student, so that he spoke more than once to his neighbour about it. Bellingham, however, flushed up at the charge, and denied curtly that he had uttered a sound. Indeed, he showed more annoyance over the matter than the occasion seemed to demand. Had Abercrombie Smith had any doubt as to his own ears, he had not to go far to find corroboration. Tom Stiles, the little wrinkled manservant who had attended to the wants of the lodgers in the turret, for a longer time than any man's memory could carry him, was sorely put to it over the same matter. "'If you please, sir,' said he, as he tidied down the top chamber one morning, "'do you think Mr. Bellingham's all right, sir?' "'All right, Styles. "'Yes, sir, right in his head, sir.' "'Why should he not be, then?' "'Well, I don't know, sir. "'His habits has changed of late. "'He's not the same man he used to be. "'Though I make free to say "'that he was never quite one of my gentlemen, "'like Mr. Hasty or yourself, sir.' He's took to a talking to himself, something awful. I wonder it don't disturb you. I don't know what to make of him, sir. 
I don't know what business it is of your styles. Well, I takes an interest, Mr. Smith. It may be forward of me, but I can't help it. I feel sometimes as if I was mother and father to my young gentleman. It all falls on me when things go wrong and the relations come. But Mr. Bellingham, sir, I want to know what it is that walks about his room sometimes when he's out and when the door's locked on the outside. Eh? Hey, you're talking nonsense, Styles. Maybe so, sir, but I heard it more than once with my own ears. Rubbish, Styles. Very good, sir. You'll ring the bell if you want me. Abercrombie Smith gave little heed to the gossip of the old man servant, but a small incident occurred a few days later which left an unpleasant effect upon his mind and brought the words of Styles forcibly to his memory. Bellingham had come up to see him late one night and was entertaining him with an interesting account of the rock tombs of Ben Hassan in Upper Egypt. When Smith, whose hearing was remarkably acute, distinctly heard the sound of a door opening on the landing below. There's some fellow gone out of your room, he remarked. Bellingham sprang up and stood helpless for a moment, with the expression of a man who is half incredulous and half afraid. I surely locked it. I am almost positive that I locked it, he stammered. No one could have opened it. Why, I hear someone coming up the steps now, said Smith. Bellingham rushed out through the door, slammed it loudly behind him, and hurried down the stairs. About halfway down, Smith heard him stop, and thought he caught the sound of whispering. A moment later, the door beneath him shut, a key creaked in the lock, and Bellingham, with beads of moisture upon his face, ascended the stairs once more and entered the room. It's all right, he said, throwing himself down in a chair. It was that fool of a dog. He had pushed the door open. I don't know how I came to forget to lock it. I didn't know you kept a dog, said Smith, looking very thoughtfully at the disturbed face of his companion. Yes, I haven't had him long. I must get rid of him. He's a great nuisance. He must be if you find it so hard to shut him up. I should have thought that shutting the door would have been enough without locking it. I want to prevent old Styles from letting him out. He's of some value, you know, and it would be awkward to lose him. I'm a bit of a dog fancier myself, said Smith, still gazing hard at his companion from the corner of his eyes. Perhaps you'll let me take a look at it. Certainly, but I'm afraid it cannot be tonight. I have an appointment. Is that clock right? And I'm a quarter of an hour late already. You'll excuse me, I'm sure. He picked up his cap and hurried from the room. In spite of his appointment, Smith heard him re-enter his own chamber and lock his door upon the inside. The interview left a disagreeable impression upon the medical student's mind. Bellingham had lied to him and lied so clumsily that it looked as if he had desperate reasons for concealing the truth. Smith knew that his neighbour had no dog. He knew also that the step which he had heard upon the stairs was not the step of an animal. But if it were not, then what could it be? There was old Styles' statement about the something which used to pace the room at times when the owner was absent. Could it be a woman? Smith rather inclined to the view. If so, it would mean disgrace and expulsion to Bellingham if it were discovered by the authorities, so that his anxiety and falsehoods might be accounted for. And yet it was inconceivable that an undergraduate could keep a woman in his rooms without being instantly detected. Be the explanation what it might, there was something ugly about it, and Smith determined, as he turned to his books, to discourage all further attempts at intimacy on the part of his soft-spoken and ill-favoured neighbour. But his work was destined to interruption that night. He had hardly caught tip the broken threads when a firm, heavy footfall came three steps at a time from below, and Hasty and Blazer and Flannels burst into the room. Still at it, said he, plumping down into his wanted armchair. What a chap you are to stew. I believe an earthquake might come and knock Oxford into a cocked hat and you would sit perfectly placid with your books among the reins. However, I won't bore you long. Three whiffs of backy and I am off. What's the news then, now, Smith, cramming a plug of bird's eye into his briar with his forefinger? Nothing very much. Wilson made 70 for the freshman against the 11. They say that they will play him instead of Buddicombe. For Buddicombe is clean off colour. He used to be able to bowl a little, but it's nothing but half follies and long hops now. Medium right, suggested Smith, with the intense gravity which comes upon a varsity man when he speaks of athletics. Inclining to fast with a work from the leg. Comes with the arm about three inches or so. He used to be nasty on a wet wicket. Oh, by the way, have you heard about Long Norton? 
What's that? He's been attacked. Attacked? Yes, just as he was turning out of the high street and within a hundred yards of the gate of old. But, but who? Ah, that's the rub. If you said what, you'd be more grammatical. Norton swears that it was not human, and indeed, from the scratches on his throat, I should be inclined to agree with him. What then, have we come down to spooks? Abercrombie Smith puffed his scientific contempt. Well, no, I don't think that is quite the idea either. I'm inclined to think that if any showman has lost a great ape lately, and the brute is in these parts, a jury would find a true bill against it. Norton passes that way every night, you know, about the same hour. There's a tree that hangs low over the path, the big elm from Rainey's garden. Norton thinks the thing dropped on him out of the tree. Anyhow, he was nearly strangled by two arms, which he says were as strong and as thin as steel bands. He saw nothing, only those beastly arms that tightened and tightened on him. He yelled his head nearly off, and a couple of chaps came running, and the thing went over the wall like a cat. He never got a fair sight of it the whole time. It gave Norton a shake-up, I can tell you. I tell him it's been as good as a change at the seaside for him. A garotta, most likely, said Smith. Very possibly. Norton says not, but we don't mind what he says. The garotta has long nails and was pretty smart at swinging himself over walls. By the way, your beautiful neighbour would be pleased if he heard about it. He has a grudge against Norton, and he's not a man, from what I know of him, to forget his little debts. But hello, old chap, what have you got in your noddle? Nothing, Smith answered curtly. He had started in his chair, and the look had flashed over his face which comes upon a man who is struck suddenly by some unpleasant idea. You looked as if something I had said had taken you on the raw. By the way, you have made the acquaintance of Master B since I looked in last, have you not? Young Monkhouse Lee told me something to that effect. Yes, I know him slightly. He's been up here once or twice. Well, you're big enough and ugly enough to take care of yourself. He's not what I should call exactly a healthy sort of Johnny. I no doubt he's very clever and all that. But you'll soon find out for yourself. Lee is all right. He's a very decent fellow. Well, so long, old chap. I row Mullins for the Vice-Chancellor's pot on Wednesday week. So mind you come down in case I don't see you before. Bovine Smith laid down his pipe and turned stolidly to his books once more. But with all the will in the world, he found it very hard to keep his mind upon his work. It would slip away to brood upon the man beneath him and upon the little mystery which hung around his chambers. Then his thoughts turned to this singular attack of which Hasty had spoken and to the grudge which Bellingham was said to owe the object of it. The two ideas would persist in rising together in his mind, as though there was some close and intimate connection between them. And yet the suspicion was so dim and vague that it could not be put down in words. Ah, oh, confound the chap, cried Smith, as he shied his book on pathology across the room. He has spoiled my night's reading, and that's reason enough if there were no other why I should steer clear of him in the future. For the ten days the medical student confined himself so closely to his studies that he neither saw nor heard anything of either of the men beneath him. At the hours when Bellingham had been accustomed to visit him, he took care to sport his oak, and though he more than once heard a knocking at his outer door, he resolutely refused to answer it. One afternoon, however, he was descending the stairs, when just as he was passing it, Bellingham's door flew open, and young Monkhouse Lee came out with his eyes sparkling and a dark flush of anger upon his olive cheeks. Close at his heels followed Bellingham, his fat, unhealthy face all quivering with malignant passion. "'You fool!' he hissed. "'You'll be sorry.' "'Very likely,' cried the other. "'Mind what I say. It's off. I won't hear of it.' "'You've promised anyhow. Oh, I'll keep that. I won't speak, but I'd rather little Eva was in her grave. Once for all, it's off. She'll do what I say. We don't want to see you again.' So much Smith could not avoid hearing. But he hurried on, for he had no wish to be involved in their dispute. There had been a serious breach between them, and that was clear enough, and Lee was going to cause the engagement with his sister to be broken off. Smith thought of Hasty's comparison of the toad and the dove, and was glad to think that the matter was at an end. Bellingham's face, when he was in a passion, was not pleasant to look upon. He was not a man to whom an innocent girl could be trusted for life. As he walked, Smith wondered languidly what could have caused the quarrel and what the promise might be which Bellingham had been so anxious that Monkhouse Lee should keep. 
It was the day of the sculling match between Hasty and Mullins, and a stream of men were making their way down to the banks of the Isis. A May sun was shining brightly, and the yellow path was barred with the black shadows of the tall elm trees. On either side, the grey colleges lay back from the road. The hoary old mothers of mines, looking out from their high mullioned windows, at the tide of young life which swept so merrily past them. Black-clad tutors, prim officials, pale reading men, brown-faced, straw-hatted young athletes in white sweaters or many-coloured blazers were hurrying towards the blue winding river which curves through the Oxford meadows. Abercrombie Smith, with the intuition of an old oarsman, chose his position at the point where he knew that the struggle, if there were a struggle, would come. Far off he heard the hum which announced the start. The gathering roar of the approach, the thunder of running feet, the shouts of the men in the boats beneath him. A spray of half-clad, deep-breathing runners shot past him, and craning over their shoulders he saw Hasty pulling a steady thirty-six, while his opponent, with a jerky forty, was a good boat's length behind him. Smith gave a cheer for his friend, and pulling out his watch, was starting off again for his chambers, when he felt a touch upon his shoulder and found that young Monkhouse Lee was beside him. "'I saw you there,' he said in a timid, depreciating way. "'I wanted to speak to you if you could spare me half an hour. "'This cottage is mine. I share it with Harrington of King's. "'Come in and have a cup of tea.' "'I must be back presently,' said Smith. "'I'm hard on the grind at the present, "'but I'll come in for a few minutes with pleasure. "'I wouldn't have come out, only Hasty is a friend of mine. "'So he is of mine. Hasn't he a beautiful style? "'Mullins wasn't in it.' But come to the cottage. It's a little den of a place, but it's pleasant to work in during the summer months. It was a small, square, white building with green doors and shutters, and a rustic trellis work porch standing back some fifty yards from the river's bank. Inside, the main room was roughly fitted up as a study. Deal table, unpainted shelves with books, and a few cheap oleographs upon the wall. A kettle sang upon a spirit stove, and there were tea things upon a tray on the table. "'Try that chair and have a cigarette,' said Lee. "'Let me pour you out a cup of tea. "'It's good of you to come in, "'for I know that your time is a good deal taken up. "'I wanted to say to you that if I were you, "'I should change my rooms at once. Eh? Hey? "'Smith sat staring with a lighted match in one hand "'and his unlit cigarette in the other. "'Yes, it must seem very extraordinary, "'and the worst of it is that I cannot give my reasons, "'for I am under a solemn promise, a very solemn promise.' But I may go so far as to say I don't think Bellingham is a very safe man to live near. I intend to camp out here as much as I can for a time. Not safe? What do you mean? Ah, that's what I mustn't say. But do take my advice and move your rooms. We had a grand row today. You must have heard us before you came down the stairs. I saw that you had fallen out. He's a horrible chap, Smith. That's the only word for him. I've had doubts about him ever since that night when he fainted. You remember when you came down. I taxed him today and he told me things that made my hair rise and wanted me to stand in with him. I'm not a straight lace, but I am a clergyman's son, you know, and I think there are some things which are quite beyond the pale. I only thank God that I found him before it was too late, for he was to have married into my family. That's all very fine, Lee, said Abercrombie Smith curtly, but either you are saying a great deal too much or a great deal too little. I give you a warning. If there is a real reason for warning, no promise can bind you. If I see a rascal about to blow a place up with dynamite, no pledge will stand in my way of preventing him. Ah, but I cannot prevent him, and I can do nothing but warn you. Without saying what you warn me against. Against Bellingham. But that is childish. Why should I fear him or any man? I can't tell you. I can only entreat you to change your rooms. You are in danger where you are. I don't even say that Bellingham would wish to injure you, but it might happen, for he is a dangerous neighbour just now. Perhaps I know more than you think, said Smith, looking keenly at the young man's boyish, earnest face. Suppose I tell you that someone else shares Bellingham's rooms. Monkhouse Lee sprang from his chair in uncontrollable excitement. You know, then, he gasped. A woman. Lee dropped back again with a groan. My lips are sealed, he said. I must not speak. Well, anyhow, said Smith, rising, it's not likely that I shall allow myself to be frightened out of my rooms, which suit me very nicely. It would be a little too feeble for me to move out all my goods and chattels, because you say that Bellingham might in some unexplained way do me an injury. 
I think that I'll just take my chance and stay where I am. And as I see that it's nearly five o'clock, I must ask you to excuse me. He bade the young student adieu in a few curt words and made his way homeward through the sweet spring evening, feeling half ruffled, half amused, as any other strong, unimaginative man might who has been menaced by a vague and shadowy danger. Black Clock Audio Tales Edited by Daniel Spitzer Black Clock Audio Tales is a PGTTCM production. Find us on the web at pgttcm.com and at Black Clock Audio on Instagram, Twitter, and the Facebook. And Black Clock Audio Tales on YouTube.